Hello and welcome to my classroom impression for the track Earth and Environment. The title of today's classroom impression is Climate Change, How and Why Do We Measure Temperature in the Past? Before we start the lecture, let me first introduce myself. My name is Hugo de Boer and I'm Assistant Professor at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at Utrecht University. And I'm also a fellow of the track Earth and Environment at Utrecht University College. And I'm also teaching in this track. In these pictures here, you can see me with my family, but you can also see pictures of those things that I study when I do research um, on climate change. So here you can see an agricultural field and you can see the clouds above. And the question that I'm interested in for my research is how does vegetation influence the weather and the climate. And what we have found is that vegetation is actually very important for supplying water to the atmosphere and thereby influencing the formation of clouds. But of course, vegetation is also very important for taking up carbon from the atmosphere. And what you can see here on the lower right is a picture, a microscopic photograph um, of a leaf. And you can see the holes in the leaf, and these are called stomata. And these stomata, they're important for taking up the CO2 from the atmosphere. And for my research, we study how these stomata change and how they influence the carbon uptake of vegetation. Today's lecture will also touch on climate change. And basically, we're interested in the question, how and why do we measure temperature in the past? So that will be the first part um, of today's lecture. After this impression on um, climate change, We'll also look into the value of liberal arts and sciences for understanding climate change. And after that, I'll talk about what you can expect during your first classes at UCU. Also, I'll provide a short overview of the track for Earth and Environment, and there will be some time for questions and discussion. Of course, not in this video itself, but I will be available online to ask uh, to answer any of your questions that you may have. So, if we talk about climate change, different people may have different ideas what climate change actually implies and what it means. So one of the most common ideas is that climate change is something bad. It will influence um, the productivity of agriculture and thereby create many issues. And of course, this is all true, but some people have other ideas. For example, they may have an historic perspective and they look into for example, ice ages and historic natural climate variability and how this has shaped our planet in the past. Or maybe people have no bad ideas about climate change at all and they think it's actually quite nice because it means that um, temperatures go up so we may enjoy warm weather and go to the beach uh, for a larger part of the year. But also climate change may really um, spark societal change and it may uh, trigger people to protest in the streets, as you can see in this photograph on the lower right. So to get some idea about how you feel about climate change and what it does to you, um, I would like to ask you to take about two minutes and write down three positive and three negative consequences that you see of climate change. Of course, I have no uh, possibility for, for to reflect on what you write down, um, but I will give some examples that I've heard in previous lectures. So just feel free to pause this video and maybe some of the points that you come up with, I would also have written down based on my experience. So let's have a look at some of the um, points people mentioned in the past. So one of the most commonly heard positive aspects of climate change is that it leads to more pleasant climate in some places, and that may also lead to increased crop productivity. This is definitely true in areas that are relatively cold and they have short growing seasons. So if it means that temperatures go up and the growing season lengthens, this can mean that crop productivity goes up and actually food production increases. The downside of that is that in other localities that are often more warm places, crop productivity may go down um, because plants crops become heat stressed or they dry out because of not enough water availability. Climate change can also be seen as a driving force for societal and scientific development and this is definitely true if I look at my own scientific research. 
because climate change has been a focal point and one of the key research questions that uh, I've been addressing in my research. Also, one interesting aspect of climate change is something we call global greening because climate change is for a large part caused by increased CO2 in the atmosphere. The CO2 also stimulates the growth of plants. And with higher plant growth, this typically means that we have more biomass on our planet. Um, and this causes an effect that we call global greening that can be seen on satellite images. And it basically means that the uh, amount of green matter on our planet increases. It's not only related to CO2 in the atmosphere, it's also related to uh, revegetation of certain areas and more um, uh, longer cropping cycles. But it's definitely something that is interesting and occurring at the moment. One negative aspect of climate change that we'll get into later as well is that climate change can be a driving force for societal conflict uh, due to resource depletion. And this is something that is uh, quite uh, stressful at a global scale and specifically related to the availability of water. Good, let's continue with the rest of the lecture. So till now we've been talking about climate change as if this is something that um, is happening without question. However, before we as scientists are so certain that climate change is actually happening and occurring, a lot of work has been done. And most of the research on climate change and climate change predict predictions resolves around developing models and running or letting these models calculate into the future to see what happens. Of course, it is not possible to look into the future because we have no crystal ball. And therefore, we use these models with different possible futures in which we take into account more or less CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. And this range of greenhouse gas emissions from low to high is given here by these different what we call scenarios. So here we have the RCP scenario 2.6, um, which basically means a very strong reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to the present, all the way up to the RCP scenario 8.5, which basically implies no reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, relative to the present. And this range of scenarios basically gives a range of possible futures that climate scientists can put into their models to explore what would be the potential range of temperature increases we're expecting to see into the future. And this potential range of temperature increases is then modeled using a whole range of slightly different models that use different physics and different model equations. Um, and these are all run together using the same standard set of background conditions. These models will then give you a big range of uncertainty, and that is given in this graph here. So on the x-axis, you see time going from 1990 up to 2050. And on the y-axis, you can see what we call the temperature anomaly in degrees Celsius. The temperature anomaly is a change in temperature from a historic mean. So this means that if it's zero, the change in temperature relative to the historic mean is zero. And if it's more, it means that it's getting warmer. So you can see here that depending on which of the scenarios you're looking at, you will get um, greater warming with the redder lines or less warming in the bluer lines, but all scenarios will give you some warming. And the uncertainty range is about two and a half degrees Celsius, depending on how much CO2 emissions are modeled. And then the big question is, how can we actually check these climate change predictions? How do we know if they're good? How do we know if they're true? So this is a problem because we cannot look into the future. So our only options are, first of all, to make sure that the model physics are correct. So the climate scientists and the model, uh, the people that are actually building the models, they really do a good job of checking that all their processes that they're modeling and all the equations that are in the models are correct and there's no mistakes and no bugs. 
then what happens is that these climate scientists they compare the different models to each other so that you can see in this graph here for example in the rcp 8.5 scenario the warmest scenario there are 39 models that are all run together using the same background conditions in terms of co2 emission they still give quite a range of outcomes if you look at the dark red lines you see still that there is about one and uh, sorry about one degree celsius range um, in these red um, model predictions depending on which model is actually used and then the third option to actually check if the models are good is to have them run the climate of the past so they can run what we call historic climate observations and that will give you at least an opportunity to see if the model is good at predicting the past of course, predicting the past is relatively easy because you know what ha has happened, but it gives you the option to see if the model is actually reproducing specific events that happened in the past. For example, historic increases in CO2 and to what extent that led uh, to warmer temperatures. Or for example, the consequences of um, volcanic eruptions that had a dimming effect on the atmosphere with less uh, sunlight and that would lead to a cooling. So if models are actually good at simulating those historic events, this gives you also confidence that they might be good at simulating the future. However, you don't really know that for sure. But this comparison of climate models with historic observations is actually a very important aspect of testing the model. And this is also what we're looking into further in this lecture. And this gets us to the main question of our lecture, how and why do we measure temperature in the past? Because the reason why do we measure temperature in the past is because we want to test um, our climate models for the future. Of course, that's one aspect. We also are just interested to, to learn what had happened in the past in terms of climate change. But in terms of future climate change, historic reconstructions of temperature are very important for model validation. Then we get to the second question, how do we measure temperature in the past? And I will discuss here some of the methods that are being applied. So the first method is historic tree rings. And actually historic tree growth um, can be used to indicate what was the climate um, at the location of the tree. And to what extent did that stimulate the tree growing faster? Or to what extent did the climate actually limited tree growth and to what extent the growth was actually stimulated or limited can be found in tree rings and the thickness of the tree rings one of the nice aspects of tree rings is that they're actually annual markers in the wood so it gives you a continuous record of the growth conditions for the tree usually this is temperature and humidity but sometimes also light intensity and cloudiness. And it allows you to count back one year to the next, going all the way into the past. And what is even nicer is that, of course, in the same location, warmer and uh, colder years will have a certain pattern in the wood. So sometimes it is actually possible to find overlapping bits of tree rings. So it's not only possible to count back one year after the next, one tree but actually overlap um, the youngest part of one tree with the oldest part of the other tree and so to make a, a continuous record that actually spans the lifetime of multiple trees going back very far into time <clears throat> one of the issues actually with using tree rings for climate change First of all, it's not always certain that the same climate variable is changing the growth characteristics of the tree. So it could be that under certain conditions, trees are limited by temperature, but under other conditions, trees are limited by not enough water or humidity. And of course, it's not very easy to find back in the tree rings exactly how the trees were, were responding to these changes in temperature and humidity. So interpreting what actually happened in the tree rings is not as easy as it may seem. Also, of course, the tree is always standing in one location. So the climate reconstruction that you get is always local. And it's not possible to create a simply 
simply create a global picture. It is possible if you combine many different tree ring records um, together in a large database, but still local climate conditions can change um, quite strongly from one small location to the next. So getting a regional or even global uh, picture of the climate is not so easy based on tree rings. The second method, how we can look at temperatures in the past, actually uses um, the oceans. And one of the important aspects here is the chemical composition of the plankton that we find in ocean sediments. <clears throat> Specifically, the calcareous skeletons of plankton is influenced by the sea surface temperature. So these little uh, planktonic species, they live in the surface ocean. And depending on how warm the surface water is, they take more or less uh, of certain chemicals in their calcareous shells. Then once these planktonic species die, they will sink to the bottom and they form layers in the ocean sediments. And if these layers are not disturbed, disturbed you can actually get <clears throat> um, a record of uh, annual layers of planktonic species that would go back in time the deeper you dig into the ocean. So if you use an ocean drilling ship that is capable of reaching the depth um, of the sea floor and then taking a sediment core, you can find back these layers of annual sediments. And once you then study the chemical composition of the plankton, the dead skeletons of the plankton, in these sediment cores, it is actually possible to reconstruct how warm the surface ocean was at the time when this um, uh, when this planktonic species was living, and this would allow you to create a slightly larger area because of the ocean surface temperatures are generally well mixed. Um, <clears throat> you can create a slightly larger uh, footprint and a slightly larger reconstruction of what the ocean temperatures were in the past. The third method that is commonly applied to reconstruct temperatures in the past is based on the chemical composition of air trapped in ice sheets. So this method also applies a drilling, but then not a drilling of the ocean floors, but a drilling of ice caps. <clears throat> For example, here you can see the Greenland ice sheet and that is a very thick layer of ice. This ice formed because every year a small layer of snow accumulates on top of the ice sheet. And over years, of course, the snow would be um, topped with a new layer of snow next year, and it compacts, and thereby it forms a very thick layer of ice that can go deep several hundred meters. And the air bubbles that were trapped in the snow when it fell will also be trapped in the ice when this layer of snow compacts and when it gets thicker and thicker. So by drilling in this ice sheet, it is then actually possible to retrace these small bubbles of air that are trapped there and find the chemical composition of the atmosphere at the time the snow fell in the deep past then you can perform a chemical analysis on the old air that is trapped in the ice. And based on that, it is possible <clears throat> to reconstruct a global air temperature. So I hope I've shown you three different methods that would allow you to reconstruct temperatures in the past. And these reconstructed temperatures can then be applied to test models against to see how well they are performing in reconstructing historic temperature changes that have occurred. So now let's look into the value of liberal arts and sciences for understanding climate change. So the liberal arts and sciences program at Utrecht University College offers a very broad range of subjects together with the opportunities to specialize in a major discipline. So here biology, chemi chemistry and physics, they are needed to provide a reliable data in the process understanding of climate change. So you really want to see and to learn how climate change works and also to get reliable data. At the other end, social sciences offers insight into societal responses to historic and future climate change and how we should maybe deal with those. Then the studies of law and politics 
they allow for the development of governance structures needed to coordinate climate action. So depending on where your interest is and what type of major you like to do, um, all of them can be applied in the context of climate change, but also in the context of what uh, we call sustainable development. So let's we'll look into the sustainable development issues also a little bit further in this lecture. But first, let's have a look at climate change and human health, because this is actually a very uh, interesting paper that recently came out that I'd like to share with you. And basically the question is, can climate become deadly hot? So can you actually die from a too warm climate? So let's have a look what the science says. So this paper, <clears throat> the title of this paper is Deadly Heat Waves Projected in Densely Populated Agricultural Regions in South Asia. And the authors of this um, paper they looked at how warm it could actually become in the future and how this would lead, how this would influence um, human health and if it could actually cause a deadly overheating. So what they used is the concept called a wet bulb temperature. The wet bulb temperature actually takes into account the temperature of, a, of an object, but also the cooling that can occur by sweating. And this cooling that can occur by sweating is, of course, very important because humans can sweat to regulate their body temperature. So this aspect is taken into account in this metric. And the authors, they found um, that if human exposure to what they call this wet bulb temperature, so this sweating temperature, um, <clears throat> becomes around 35 degrees Celsius for even a few hours will result in the death of the fittest humans under shaded, well-ventilated conditions. So if it becomes so warm that um, <clears throat> even with sweating, the temperature becomes higher than 35 degrees Celsius, humans will die. So the question is, will this happen? Will it ever become so hot that humans will die during a heat wave? So what they found is that in the most warm climate scenario, so the RCP 8.5 scenario, large portions um, of South Asia, especially India, would become so hot that they would surpass this 35 degrees Celsius wet bulb temperature during some of the months in the year. And a lot of people live here, and not all of the people that are living here have air conditioning um, houses. Actually, many of the people don't have air conditioned houses. So this is something <clears throat> that really struck me as something very, very dangerous, that so many people could become exposed to deadly heat waves um, because it's just so warm that even when you sweat a lot, you cannot regulate your body temperature and you would just die from overheating. So this is just I want something I wanted to share with you, um, and I hope it makes an impact to think seriously about climate change. And also the question is, can we trust the science and the model predictions? And I hope by giving you the information of how we actually validate our climate models, you have a little bit better understanding of um, how valid they are and that they're actually doing quite a good job at predicting climate for the future. So now let's look into the reality of studying at UCU and what you can expect during your first classes. So what you can see here in this slide um, is a very common classroom setting. So you can see me here talking with one of the students. Of course, now during the COVID times, we don't have such full classrooms, but I hope we can return back to that setting <coughs> very soon. But one of the um, nice things in the classes here is that we have such close interactions with the students that we can have a lot of time to discuss um, the material that we are teaching. So typically what I do is I start with a 45 minute lecture covering the lecture notes and including certain discussions. And then we have 45 minute group work to work through a set of questions or problems. Often we use computer models to support uh, our tutorials and to do calculations. Another example of what you can expect during your classes is what you can see here. So this is a very different setting. And here we are in the botanical gardens of Utrecht University. 
And here we are in a biology lab. And what we're doing here is a summer course where we are studying the processes of how plants actually store carbon in forests. So how do trees take up carbon? How much carbon do they store in their biomass? Um, how fast do they grow? And how do you take these measurements? And in the course, the students, they can develop their own research campaign and they can conduct, uh, then they can conduct the field work themselves, collect the data, and then also analyze the data in the lab, but also um, using statistical software. And at the end of the course, the students will write a report and do a group presentation of their work. And I really like this type of teaching where students are invited to come up with their own research questions and then go into the field and test. <clears throat> Maybe to give you a little bit background about the track earth and environment, um, because maybe this, that this is something that you find interesting. So the track earth and environment basically combines the fields of earth science and environmental science. So the earth sciences mostly focus on abiotic systems. So that is the climate system, geology, tectonics. And it looks mostly into long-term processes at geological timescales. And it involves physics, chemistry, physical geography, and mathematics. Environmental science is, is a bit more green, so it takes into account biotic systems, <coughs> but also socio-ecological systems. So these are biotic systems that also have a human component. And it looks at ecological processes, which are basically the interaction between abiotic and biotic processes. And it looks into human-induced changes in the biot biotic and the abiotic system, and it involves fields uh, of biology, physics, chemistry, and mathematics. So the structure of the earth and environment track is that we start with level one courses um, and they provide an entrance to the track and they cover the breadth of the field. Then we have our level two courses and they allow for a specialization in the relevant subfields. Then we have our level three courses that allow for integration and the application of the knowledge um, that you gained during your level two courses. <clears throat> it also allows for the interaction between students with different liberal arts and sciences profiles because different students may have taken different level two courses. So they're all part of the same temple, but they're basically different pillars that are all coming together in the level three course. And also the level three course prepares you for the thesis, which is the final um, the, the goal of your of your of your track. I will touch briefly on the courses that we have, but at level one we have introduction earth and environment. Then we have an environmental co um, course focusing on ecosystem change in the Anthropocene. Then we have a course on geology, global processes, earth resources, and a course on atmospheric physics uh, and climate. <clears throat> then our level three course is quantifying earth boundaries. And here you can apply the knowledge that you gained in your level two courses. And then you end with your level three thesis. And also we have the lab courses that I discussed earlier, but we have different lab courses with all different focuses. So apart from the earth and environment track, we also offer courses with um, a focus on sustainability science. And this relates very closely to the track earth and environment. So many students that are interested in sustainability science would also be interested in the earth and environment track. Basically, sustainability science focuses <coughs> on all aspects of development. And that is shown here by the uh, sustainable development goals that were developed by the United Nations in 2015. And basically, they set out the goals for 2030 in terms of many aspects of society. For example, one of the goals is no poverty. Uh, one of the goals is zero hunger, but also we have a goal on gender equality, life on land, climate action, <clears throat> uh, or for example, peace, justice, and strong institutions. So these goals, they cover all aspects of human life. And we basically are dealing with a very complex issue with many interactions across society. And the earth and environment knowledge is needed, of course, together with knowledge from other domains 
um, to reach these goals. So let me summarize my lecture. Um, so first of all, uh, I hope that you've learned that the track Earth and Environment covers many topics ranging from long-term Earth sciences processes to more contemporary processes in ecology, and that a liberal arts and sciences background <coughs> can help you oversee the diversity of topics related to climate change. So the processes, how do we get the data? How do we interpret the data? How do we check if our models are actually good? But also in relation to society and political solutions for climate change. Um, and I also hope that you've seen that the classes at University College are very diverse and they're ranging from traditional lectures uh, to computer modeling and also field work. So I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer them and also talk with you uh, online. Bye-bye.